Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I appreciate your interest in learning the real facts, the real truth about health, and, and this specifically during my presentation, the real truth about the massive venture to restructure the genetic core of the world's food supply. Now, I'd like to begin by asking you all to just imagine a set of certain set of circumstances. So let's just suppose the radical technology uh, became developed through which novel forms of food could be produced. And let's further suppose that although this method was highly unnatural, its proponents were able to convince most people that it's essentially the same as producing new varieties of crops via natural breeding. Now, let's further suppose that the very first ingestible product that this technology churns out, let's, let's say it's a food supplement. In fact, let's say it's a food supplement of an essential amino acid that we all need to live. Let's say that this food supplement, which ordinarily is quite safe, causes a major epidemic that kills dozens of Americans, seriously sickens thousands more, many of whom remain invalids for the rest of their lives. And let's postulate an additional fact. Let's suppose that researchers discover that the product contains a highly, highly unusual mix of contaminants, at least one of which is deadly at extremely low concentrations, so low that most chemicals present at such a level would be completely harmless. And let's further imagine that the evidence as a whole strongly points to the new technology as the cause of that lethal contamination. Okay, now that we're going, let's suppose that now not just the first food supplement produced by this technology, but some years later the very first whole food that it's able to produce and commercialize causes a troubling pattern of stomach lesions in the laboratory rats that are consigned to dine on it, and that in another group of such unfortunate rodents, seven deaths occur <laughs> within the very first two weeks, while only one death befalls uh, each of the three comparative control groups that were spared consuming that novel product. And to further foul the picture, let's assume that the government scientists who review the test results conclude that they raise a safety issue that has not been satisfactorily resolved. And to make things even dicier, let's suppose that another division of government scientists uh, who review a separate aspect of this product, completely separate from the issue of the stomach lesions and the unusual deaths, declare that that feature, that independent feature that they're examining, in itself poses a serious health hazard. Okay, now that we're warmed up, let's assume that a task force of government scientists thoroughly assesses this technology and concludes that it significantly differs from conventional modes of food production, that its products entail a unique set of risks, higher risks, and that each therefore must be subjected to rigorous safety testing before it is allowed on the market. Furthermore, why don't we make things even more ominous by imagining that the first food produced by this technology that is subjected to truly rigorous testing by independent experts who are free of industry influence yields very troubling results, and that because the study is of high quality, it gets published in a prestigious scientific journal. Okay, now that we're becoming bolder, Let's suppose that many other well-conducted studies on the foods created by this technology detect significant adverse effects on the lab animals, and that one long-term study finds serious injury to the livers and kidneys, abnormal onset of large tumors, and increased mortality. Let's further envision that when independent scientists scrutinize the research that has been performed by the corporation producing the foods, they in several cases find that the data that was declared to support findings of safety 
actually raise serious doubts. And to make the plot even more sinister, let's suppose that in virtually every case of adverse results, there is good reason to think that the results have resulted from some aspect of that technology itself, and that similar deleterious disruptions could have occurred in other foods produced by it. So if such a technology actually did exist, and if all these suppositions we've just made about it were concrete realities, not just suppositions, how do you think society should deal with it? I assume that just about everybody would agree that the foods it creates should be banned and that the enterprise that creates them should be promptly curtailed. And I doubt that anyone would consider that to be an extreme or unreasonable course of action. In fact, I think most people would suppose that in such circumstances, that particular policy would be fully justified. And just to be clear, that policy that would seem appropriate and necessary in almost everyone's eyes would not be to stick a label on these products, but to ban them. Well, as surprising as it may seem, and as unpalatable as it may seem, especially to people who have been trusting what our government, the United States government, and the scientific establishment have been telling them, such a technology does in fact exist, and every one of the suppositions I've just set forth is not a mere supposition, but a rock-solid reality. This technology, of course, is what is called genetic engineering, or by its proponents, genetic modification or genetic enhancement. Uh, it's technically referred to as recombinant DNA technology. And all those supposedly hypothetical situations have actually happened. They are concrete events that are unshakably linked to this technology. Let's go back and fill in some of the details now that we know that what I'm talking about actually has happened. It's not hypothesis at all. Okay, I think you've all heard ad infinitum and probably to many of you ad nauseum the claims that genetic engineering is just a simple uh, mild extension of traditional breeding practices that have been practiced from, you know, for millennia. You know, it's just, it's nothing different than Luther Burbank did, than George Washington Carver did. It, and in fact, it's far more precise, that's the claim, far more predictable, and that it's at least as safe as not safer. That's bunk, total baloney. Okay. Now, it's very, very different. In fact, uh, a, an eminent scientist who received a Nobel Prize, spent his career as a professor at Harvard, Dr. George Wald, stated in regard to genetic engineering that it represents the biggest break in nature that has occurred in human history. I'll repeat that. The biggest break in nature that has occurred in human history. Contrast that with the claims of seamless continuum that we are constantly subjected to. And Dr. Wald continued that genetic engineering should not be confused with any other intervention performed by human beings into the natural order, that it stood apart. It was dramatically distinct, and that's why he called it the biggest break. Also, an eminent uh, molecular biologist, Dr. Lieb Cavalieri, who, by the way, in May of 1998, was selected by the American Association for the Advancement of Science to uh, represent the perspective of science at a major forum it held on genetically engineered crops. There were three main speakers, Dr. Cavalieri, representing the perspective of science, a representative from Monsanto, representing the perspective of the industry, and then a, an executive with a public interest organization representing the viewpoint of consumers. So Dr. Cavalieri has some credibility. And he also speaks 
very boldly and straight, straightforward, in a very straightforward manner, as he did that morning at that conference, uh, where he basically stated that genetic engineering is very different, uh, that it can, its products cannot be presumed safe. And th about three weeks later, he was back in Washington, D.C. at a press conference that the Alliance for Biointegrity hosted announcing the lawsuit that had just been filed that day against the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, a lawsuit in which Dr. Cavalieri was one of the nine eminent scientists who stood up as plaintiffs in that lawsuit. As was mentioned in the introduction, that was highly unprecedented for a group of eminent scientists to actually be suing a federal administrative agency on the grounds that one of its policies is scientifically unsound. Now remember, these individuals, these scientists, were not just scientific advisors, they weren't expert witnesses, they were plaintiffs in the lawsuit. They signed the complaint. That was unprecedented to have nine such experts. And at that press conference, Dr. Cavalieri, Dr. Cavalieri looked at the media, looked into the bank of cameras that were in the back, and he said, the scientists that have been claiming that genetic engineering is essentially the same as traditional breeding and just as safe are perpetrating a massive sham. <laughs> That's the word he used. They were perpetrating a sham, and he said they should be ashamed of themselves, and they should be. And then he added, and you can quote me on that, unfortunately, to, I've looked at uh, all of the uh, newspaper articles and news reports that came out of that conference, not a single one quoted him on that. In fact, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think any of them even noted that we had nine scientists who were uh, stating that the uh, FDA's presumption that genetically engineered foods are safe, that that presumption was scientifically unsound, that didn't get reported. What got reported was the propaganda coming from the grocery manufacturers of America in response to our suit, stating that we were trying to turn back the clock and we were basically trying to turn our backs on science. The whole reason that we had nine scientists was to show that we were in line with science and we're trying to restore science. That's how bad the coverage is in the United States media. That's why the foods have permeated our market. I'll talk about that more later. There's an entire chapter in the book titled, The Malfunction of the Mainstream America, American Media, Pliant Accomplices in Cover-Up and Fraud. And that title and subtitle, unfortunately, are not an exaggeration. I'll talk about that more later, but I want to skip ahead now. I mean, I want to keep going, and then I will develop that theme of the media and why, uh, why the role it has played has been so fundamental, why it is a key accomplice in the disinformation. Okay, now what about that first ingestible product of genetic engineering, the, uh, that food supplement? It was a supplement of the essential amino acid L-tryptophan, and L-tryptophan had been consumed regularly and in large quantities by hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, in the United States, Europe, and other countries for years and years. And uh, it was actually a very safe and effective alternative to uh, to drugs like Prozac and others, and uh, it, because it helped people settle down and sleep without prescription drugs, uh, that particular supplement that caused the epidemic was able to be traced back to one, one, oh, one and only one of the manufacturers of L-tryptophan supplements, a Japanese uh, company called Shoadanka, and it turned out that when further research was done, it was discovered that Shoadanka, several years before, had done something that none of the other manufacturers had done. In the interest of cranking out more L-tryptophan in a shorter amount of time, it had genetically engineered the bacteria that are used to synthesize the L-tryptophan. It had genetically engineered them. It had given them extra copies of the genes involved in the synthesis of L-tryptophan, and it had increased the production. But apparently, it also disrupted the metabolism 
of those bacteria, and it's known that genetic engineering can do that, that forcing living organisms to overproduce a, 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 a protein uh, that they, or an amino acid, any substance that they ordinarily produce can create problems. And these bacteria do ordinarily produce uh, L-tryptophan, but they, it's, they're its production is highly regulated. It can't get above a different, a certain level, and there are many checks and balances which were overridden through the genetic engineering. And again, uh, the other side will claim that, uh, that genetic engineering has been completely absolved. That's total bunk as well. The evidence as a whole strongly points to the fact that genetic engineering was the cause. But even if we don't take it that far, in the FDA's files, I found in the 44,000 plus pages of documents that the lawsuit I initiated forced the FDA to turn over, I found a memo from the FDA's own biotechnology coordinator reporting on a meeting he had had when the government accounting office queried him, questioned him about the L-tryptophan incident, whereas the, the FDA representative, when he, when he reported on that incident to Congress, to a congressional subcommittee, didn't even mention the word genetic engineering and blamed it all on health food supplements, and the FDA used that epidemic as an excuse to take all L-tryptophan off the market, which, by the way, was a boon to the prescription drug industry because it eliminated a cheap uh, alternative to prescription drugs. Uh, and the FDA had been trying to get rid of L-tryptophan off the market for years, by the way, and it had failed. And that epidemic gave it the excuse to do so. Never in public doesn't talk about it, uh, genetic engineering, tries to get genetic engineering off the hook. But when the government accounting office held the FDA's biotechnology coordinator to account, he had to admit that L-tryptophan could not be ruled out as the cause of that epidemic. So he admitted it couldn't be ruled out. And the evidence as a whole shows that it is far more likely than not that it was the cause.